This morning, we have a very special speaker. It's one of our Sangha members. She leads the study circle. She's also a Zen life teacher and uh, a Zen student. She studies with Sensei. She works as a research associate professor in radiation oncology at Northwestern University. And as a meditation practitioner and ZLMC Sangha member, she's interested in the intersection between Buddhist thought and science and possible ways scientific concepts can be used to widen our understanding of self. This morning's speaker, of course, is Tatiana Ponescu, and she'll be talking to us this morning about matter and time. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. And first, let me apologize. I was uh, kind of out of it because I had a long trip last month, so I did not send my title of my talk on time. So time and matter talk was uh, the talk that I gave in September of last year, and somehow that actually cropped up as the title, whereas the title was supposed to be Forgetting the Self. So um, I will talk about this um, topic that has plagued me personally for a long time, question of ego, if you will. And I will start by a disclaimer that I am not a psychologist and I'm not a Zen scholar, I am just a Zen enthusiast and a biologist who had had some formal training in biology and population genetics and that is informing my views about who we are as humans. But let me start with what I think, uh, what I personally think about ego. Um, so, um, I have, some while ago, come across this story, which is a fable that involves animals, uh, about a story about a scorpion and a frog. And that story impressed me uh, favorably. <laughs> I thought it was a good story to keep remembering. And the story goes like this, and I will read it from Vicky. Um, uh, allegedly, the story has appeared in 1933, and it goes like this. The scorpion wants to cross a river but cannot swim, so it, carries, uh, so it asks a frog to carry it across. The frog hesitates, afraid that the scorpion might sting it, but the scorpion promises not to, pointing out that it would drown if it killed the frog in the middle of the river. The frog considers this argument sensible and agrees to transport the scorpion. Midway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog anyway, dooming them both. The dying frog asks the scorpion why it stung, despite knowing the consequence, to which the scorpion replies, it is in my nature. So, the story is meant um, uh, to be a story about uh, not hanging out with bad people and how they will eventually, you know, come to bite us and how that is something to be avoided because it is dangerous, etc. Um, there are also stories about um, some previous versions of this story from Persia, where it is not a frog, but it's a turtle and it has a shell, so it doesn't get killed, etc., etc. But all of that is not so important. What is important is that after I've heard this story, like for the third or fourth time, it suddenly occurred, ah, no, the scorpion is actually my ego. So, when I'm going around and carrying my ego on my back, or you know, it is a part of me as it is, it will eventually sting me and or it will sting other people. And likewise, other people have their own egos and they will also sting me, possibly sooner or later, depending on the case, circumstances, and everything else. And so, when this dawned on me, um, that also has inspired me to try to be more compassionate. So to link to Linda's talk from last week about compassion and generosity, if we truly want to be generous, we have to realize that what applies to us applies to others. And in the end, we are all very, very similar. And it is just all a question of degrees of concrete situation and so on. So then after that, I started to still consider this further and think about how would this story appear um, in the context 
of uh, being a bodhisattva. If you are a bodhisattva, your job is to carry others to the other side. And, you know, <laughs> you're carrying them on your back, possibly, and possibly they still have their ego. So what happens then, you know? Do you get stung? Do you not get stung? Do you sting them or yourself as you're going across? What is actually the whole idea about how we should be coping with our ego? And there is also this like neat little side thought that also occurred to me, and that is that um, bodhisattvas are also supposed to be um, not going to the other side. They are supposed to be going back and forth. And perhaps it is actually the existence of ego that makes it easier because, you know, we are really not ready to be on the other side as long as we keep our ego. So, all of that now aside, I would like to um, talk to you about what I personally think about what ego is. And as I said, I'm a biologist and I'm a very big believer in the importance of matter. And because we are material beings that procreate, uh, we had to become um, adapted for survival and survival of the species over long periods of time because in a sense we exist longitudinally as a type of animal on this planet. So I then believe in biological evolution and the one thing that people oftentimes hear about biological evolution and have issues with is this uh, statement uh, evolution is survival of the fittest. So People view that as an excuse to, you know, go around and um, that other will see that. Obviously, it is always others. Uh, that others will see it as a good excuse to go around and, you know, just grab what you need for yourself and that that will be the survival of the fittest, that the fittest is the strongest and so on. However, that is not really how biological evolution works. Evolution works on groups of populations and the groups that are existing together. And what is good for the long-term thriving and surviving of that group, that is what is good for the species long-term. So because this um, is the truth, uh, there is real material benefit to uh, behaviors that are not necessarily behaviors that support self-preservation. So, for example, uh, in one of the scientific journals, I think it was scientific reports, there was this cool article about a year ago, year and a half ago, and a lovely video about a small tribe of capuchin monkeys, they are those like very tiny ones, uh, who have uh, been um, attacked by a boa constrictor. And a boa is taking away one of their young baby monkeys, and the whole tribe is attacking them. So, if the monkeys are able to try to defend their own, hopefully we should be able to do the same. So, I believe, however, that this behavior is also really firmly, firmly rooted in the fact that we are material beings and that we have um, materially evolved to be the way how we are. And so I was thinking often a lot about our sense organs and the correspondence or relatively weak correspondence of them and of, of these sense organs and certain um, capacities that we have. So we have eyes, uh, we have sight, and then we have vision. So we have that and many other sense organs that are helping us to survive as material beings in this material world. However, I think, and this is now my completely going out on the limb, this is my own opinion, not connected with anybody, um, I do believe that we also have senses that do not directly correspond to organs, or rather they correspond to brain and a couple of other things and uh, all at the same time. And these are sorts of senses that are not directly correlated to organs. And 
I believe at this moment that these are sense of self, sense of loyalty, and sense of logic. And I think that we have evolved these and that these are part of our makeup, that they're hardwired in us, even though we do not have the ability to point and say, oh, this is my sense of logic organ. No, these are the no organ senses, if you will. And they are benefiting our survival um, of humans as a species. And they are at the same time, however, the most important components of our ego. And I think that our ego depends on all of these three things. So um, what do I have to support this opinion? Um, if we think about um, ego as these no sense organs, uh, we can see that it can be a source of personal and social and ecological benefit. Um, so we all know about examples when our logic sense of logic has tempered our, for example, misguided sense of loyalty, or our sense of loyalty has tempered our self-interest um, drives, etc. Or else we can think about the occasions when our sense of self uh, had tempered our sense of logic because we understood that certain things were logical are perhaps not beneficial to ourselves. So, you know, we will not go and try to console somebody who is currently, you know, pointing a knife at us. It is not a good plan. So logic helps and loyalty helps and sense of self all help us to survive as individuals and they help us to survive as a species. So um, I put here a note for myself that depending on the time, I will maybe talk about um, some examples um, some uh, I may give a little tangent story or two about examples of this behavior so one um, one example that like really stunned me uh, when I read it was example um, about was one story that a uh, Russian writer Solzhenitsyn who spent most of his life in, in work camps in Russia and eventually he managed to escaped the country and came to US and lived here for a very long time. Anyways, when he, well, his first wife actually ended up being a stool pigeon for the government and she was uh, betraying him and she was one of the people who put him to, into the, one of the camps. His second wife, however, was a real love story, etc. And so when two of them were discussing whether they will have children or not, they knew that having children would be one avenue uh, for possible exploitation and for them getting blackmailed to do or say things that they do not agree with. So they have made a decision that they will actually have kids, but that they will actually let things go. So at least, you know, initially they said, well, you know, we cannot, we cannot protect our children when they are born. They are they are so they have logically approached this and they decided that it is more important to be truthful etc and you know not to not to fall down uh, to manipulation by the government luckily for them that did not happen but you know at least they had that discussion which sort of is interesting especially today to consider anyways um so this was one reflection about um how we can employ all of these different aspects of ourselves to make a decision informed by all, all, all the types of, all the three facets of ego that we have, loyalty, logic, and sense of self. Obviously, um, uh, if you want to reflect on the cases when this has led to us injuring ourselves or others or ourselves getting injured, there are plenty of opportunities for that as well. We are being mindless about use of plastic, for example, as Blair just mentioned, and we are contaminating the environment out of um, just um, love of the sense of ease uh, and connection between that and our sense of self. So uh, then, um, what do I think um, can be done with this further on? So 
as my fourth thing that I want to discuss is um, I want to give you sort of a materialist and Buddhist view on ego together, if you will. So if our ego is made of these no organ senses, um, and, because, and as it arose by a biological evolution, we actually cannot evade it. Uh, we have to have all these three senses that we have we all have it and we can ignore one or the other to the detriment of others. So um, what I want to say is that very often within ourselves, these uh, no, no organ senses are at war with one another. So we have our logic, loyalty and sense of self fighting each other and butting heads and constantly one or the other is weaker or stronger and um, there is a constant turmoil in us. So, for example, um, I have been for a long while thinking about something that I personally told, call sense of cognitive dissonance and what that means is I am doing something that my logic is telling me is really idiotic. Uh, or rather, I, I say to myself that I care about this, but I also care about that, and those things actually do not match. And the example that I like to use is the fact that I have two dogs that I adore and I like to sleep with them, and they sleep with me in the same bed. However, I also like to have clean bed. So I I wash my bed sheets every you know, two weeks, something like that, and I then believe when I go to bed that I'm now sleeping in a clean bed, but the fact is my dogs are still walking down the street. I do not <laughs> wash them before they go to bed every night. And so the moment they jump in, that bed is really no longer clean. So there is this you know, cognitive dissonance that I am putting up with. This is minor thing, it's not a big deal, but it is an example of how I am sort of um, lying to myself and coping with that just fine. And we all do that sort of stuff all the time. Now, all that is not such a bad example, but of course there are other examples where we can think about lying to ourselves in ways that are far more consequential. And then the other thing that has happened with human societies is I believe that uh, we have developed over the centuries uh, different types of belief systems or formal organizations that are uh, capitalizing on uh, things such as, for example, our sense of loyalty. So while these things are presumably buttressing our sense of loyalty, they are actually oftentimes replacing it and, um, and in the process also cutting down severely on our ability to, um, uh, on our sense of self or our sense of logic and so on. So this can be a good support for human loyalty, but it can also lead to our adherence to the rules that will eventually supplant the loyalty and this can also become a source of our needs. And we can imagine about many examples like that, I don't know, like, you know, fraternitary hazing rituals are, you know, one of those things that are very simple and very everyday thing. And again, here what we have is an organization that is presumably calling upon your loyalty, but it is actually at the same time suppressing your sense of logic and your um, sense of self. And for real, loyalty too gets abused because you're not really loyal to people who you are abusing. There are good examples as well. And there are some uh, tangent stories that I could tell you, but um, even though I like them, I'm going to skip it because <laughs> I don't want to talk too much. Um, so, um, so what happens then? Uh, we oftentimes feel like we should be deadening our ego. So we are just, you know, punching it into a, into a bowl or into a box or something, and we are trying to uh, apply pressure on it. And we most often really only recognize our ego as our sense of self. We do not notice so much 
that loyalty can also be harmful, that sense of logic can also be harmful, that we can be, you know, abusive to people who are around us because their behavior is illogical, right? And who knows, they might be in pain, they may not be able to tell us what, their, what the issue is, and yet we expect them to be logical. I oftentimes think that my dogs could be more logical, but they aren't. Um, so I think that I am actually the blind one there. So, so this, this issue of deadening our ego is something that people have tried to do over many, many generations. And, you know, um, this is not possible. We have to breathe, we have to eat, and we have to have our ego because it is just the same. I mean, we cannot like not see all of a sudden by, by decree to ourselves. We cannot stop hearing because we don't want to. We can, I suppose, put in earplugs or close our eyes and tie them, but it is not really depriving us of that sense. And I think that we cannot deprive ourselves from the senses um, that uh, sort of go in into our ego. And because we cannot do that, um, this is, um, there is a constant battlefield in us. And um, there, there's, on, on this battlefield, these three senses are at war. And this is a source of suffering, which um, Dogen, who is the um, father of the Zen lineage that we belong to here, uh, Dogen refers this to, um, to this problem as the Buddha's truth. He views that that is what Buddha has recognized as the problem of humanity and that that is actually the thing that needs to be solved in order for us to have some peace, for us to be happy. So the recipe that Dogen prescribes for coping with ego is to make the full use of it. So to completely engage with it, to take it in, and to embrace it, and to fully and completely develop it. Because only then we will actually be able to forget about it. So um, how does this, this work? Um, um, I'm going to talk about that. But before I go further, I'm going to say that Dogen has expressed this in a manner that is convoluted. So what he said was, to learn the Buddha's truth is to learn ourselves. To learn ourselves is to forget ourselves. So at the first glance, this, this appears like we need to abandon ourselves, to forget about ourselves. But the fact is, we actually need to use ourselves. So if we were a car, if our ego was a car, when you're learning how to drive, you're fully conscious of switching gears, of whether you are turning the signal or not. But when you are an experienced driver and you, are fully taking, you have fully taken possession of that car, things are sort of moving along and they are functioning and we are not in anguish anymore. And I've just been during this past month that when I was visiting abroad, I was with a friend who had learned to drive and, you know, I could see her <laughs> anguish. I could hear her call her boyfriend on the phone to tell him that she has parked, parallel parked like in only two tries and how wonderful that was, you know, it's like, cool. Anyways, I think that she will not behave like that in a year or two when I go to visit her again. So we can do the same with our ego, but there are all, all of these three things need to be addressed. And Dogen gives us recipes for that as well. So uh, he starts uh, by um, he he's saying that we, um, although this is not explicitly said, it is said through uh, through, through his work um, gradually. Uh, he is. Um, advocating our developing prowess with our three no sense no organ senses that i call uh, as i call them um, so loyalty logic and self and also he says that we have to have an understanding and appreciation of how this works and an affection for being alive and for every aspect of who we are so i will now um, 
read a few quotes from him. So he talks of affection for our life and for ourselves in uh, a Dharma Hall discourse number 124 in a book, Ehe Koroku, or Dogen's Extensive Record. And I will just read a part of this um, Dharma Hall discourse, and it goes like this. Now the spring winds are whirlwind, and the spring rains have continued. Even this smelly skin bag, born from our father and mother, cherishes this time. How could the bones, flesh, and marrow correctly transmitted by Buddha's ancestors despise it? Those who despise it truly are beasts. So, we are this skin bag that is born of our father and mother. So there is, you know, a degree of his um, talking disparagingly about himself. However, he is also saying, cherish this time, cherish being here, being alive, seeing the whirlwind of winds and the spring rain. And then in a Dharma Hall Discourse 434, Dogen also says, the family style of all Buddhas and ancestors is to first arouse the vow to save all living beings by removing suffering and providing joy. Only this family style is inexhaustibly bright and clear. In the lofty mountains, we see the moon for a long time. As clouds clear, we first recognize the sky. Cast loose down the precipice, the moonlight shares itself with the 10,000 forms. Even when climbing up the bird's path, taking good care of yourself is spiritual power. So, taking care of yourself is a form of spiritual power for Dogen. So, this is what Dogen has said about um, love of, your, of oneself. And then he also, as I said, in a more convoluted manner, gave instructions for accomplishing the mastery of the three no organ senses that make ego. And so, uh, people oftentimes talk uh, about Dogen's use of paradox, which is overabundant and many people are irritated by it. Um, Many people say, oh, Dogen is using paradox to frustrate our sense of log logic and to make us sort of crack and, you know, see that the logic is irrelevant, etc., etc. Actually, I do not think so. Um, oftentimes when people, uh, well, I have heard this from a person who was working on Dogen translation, uh, who said that when you try to translate Dogen and you cannot do it, uh, you take a step back, you wait some time, then you try to read the literal meaning and then actually it opens itself. And the, the translation, then things all of a sudden make sense. So all, Dogen is actually very often literally correct. And um, I think that what he's teaching us through this paradox within paradox, which is then literal truth, he's teaching us to strengthen our own self of logic. So our self of logic is not something that we should abandon. We should use it, we should use it, we should use it, we should feel full mastery of it, and we should know, know what are its limits. So that is how we get to know, that is how we get the mastery of it. And then um, Dogen also gives a ton of instructions for proper behavior. He has uh, fascicles uh, that are written about how does the cook behave, how do you clean your teeth, uh, how do you behave when you're a month, monk in a monastery. And these instructions uh, that are very, very minute instructions for correct behavior are actually an ideal way to grow a sense of belonging to a community that is not um, a type of loyalty that is self-aware. You are doing these things because you're supposed to be doing them. You're not, not doing them because you like your fellow members. You like your fellow members because you actually like them. Is that is how I view this example. And then, of course, uh, in order for us to get better view, a uh, better handle on our sense of self, uh, Dogen is constantly giving us instructions for Zazen. So sitting meditation is one way for us to gain mastery of our sense of self. 
by being able to see it for what it is, uh, to, to revel in it at times and to let go of it at times and to actually keep letting go of it because um, the uh, self-interest aspect of sense of self is not the only type of sense of self that is available to us. So, I do believe that when Dogen um, talks about dropping off of body and mind, he is talking about this training program that he gives through all of his works. And uh, by dropping off body and mind, he is actually uh, talking about dro dropping off these components of our ego in the very first place, if you will. So I will now conclude. Um, we, each of us, have an ego. And having an ego is not avoidable. Uh, and however, we do not have to be at war with that ego or allow the three parts of our ego, if you will, to be at war within themselves um, and between themselves. And if we keep using Zazen, we may ultimately train the sense of self to let go of control a little and allow our whole ego to be more mature and for us to be no longer stung and no longer stung the others. And that is my talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tanya. I'm really fascinated by this idea of the ego being made up of these non-organ senses. Thank you. Um, um, I yeah. I mean, it make, and it makes it, it fits. I mean, I, I, to think about those as, like you said, like we can no long, we can no more get rid of logic, loyalty, or sense of self, then we can get rid of our sense of smell or our sense yes. of touch. It's just yeah. part of who we are. It's just a really interesting way to think about things. Um, and it, it's, when you were talking, it just strikes me of, um, you know, there's a lot of different systems of thought that talk about sort of the different parts of us, mm -hmm. you know? And, yes. Um, I'm not sure what to say about that other than it's um, jogged some really great paths for me to, hooks for me to go and explore a little bit more, especially in relationship to um, Buddhism. Uh, and as you said, you know, we, we tend to sort of think about Buddhism as pounding out the ego, when in fact, I think it's really about becoming, just becoming more aware of it. And then as you're, pushing further and saying and just becoming comfortable with it as if it's our breathing or our eyesight. Um, so I, I mean, really love that. Thank it's a, it's a really interesting way to think about things. I mean, I'm aware that um, saying, you know, we need to be more comfortable with our ego may seem like a carte blanche to, you know, do whatever we want and just be comfortable with it. That's not what it is about. I really do not think that no matter who we are, we cannot really get comfortable with our ego unless we are actually doing stuff that is ethically appropriate. Um, and as that feeds back, uh, then, then we are more comfortable. And so things sort of grow together, if you will. Yeah. One thing that inspired me to look in, to try to come up with my, my own theory of self, if you will, is I've tried to come up with something that felt comfortable. And um, I even read some um, uh, philosophy papers that I enjoyed immensely, but uh, none of that uh, felt, um, none of that felt based on evolution. <laughs> you know, I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I feel like, you know, we would not have ego if it wasn't, if it didn't serve us. So, so, you know, how can I think about ego as something that serves us? And this is what I came up with. And I'm sure it will change. And just as my thing about the scorpion and the frog has changed over, oops, over a period of a year or something, so will this. Yeah. 
I just said that there has to be some sense of self for the organism to defend. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I look at my dogs. They have a very, very clear sense of self. They are. Um, they have certain strange behaviors that agitate me that they had developed in order to live in a household with other dogs and humans. So generally, if I agitate one of the dogs, it will go and attack the other dog. So they will not attack me, even though I am the perpetrator, they'll attack the, the other one because, you know, there will be less of a repercussion for that. At least that's what they think. So, you know, there are things that happen. Yeah, uh, something I've been thinking about lately. I was I was listening to this book by this priest named Richard Rohr, who's like heavily influenced by Carl Jung, and he he talks a lot about. Um, well, I think I think Jung talked a lot about. You kind of need the ego early in life to kind of get yourself positioned, and then it becomes less important later. Mm -hmm. And I've been kind of feeling that in myself, and I'd be curious, uh, what do you think? Do you think that ego is just as important throughout the duration, or do you think as we get older, that's less? I do, I do not see how we can avoid having it um, and you know um, um, I could I could see that uh, there is a place for what you said and this sort of in, intersect because um, the more um, experienced you are with your ego the less of a the less of a need there is to push it up you know, upper you know forward most if you will so so that is i think how that goes so there are there are people online also uh yes uh, tanya i just wanted to say i thought this was such an interesting talk and so much to think about thank you and i loved your examples and i love that it's really original thought thank you so much Tanya, thank you. I really enjoyed this. And, um, you know, it, I started thinking, I, I really like thinking of them as organs, you know, as a body work, as a former body worker and someone who works with embodiment, it helps me um, relate how I've worked with different body systems and sense organs to then begin to work with um, these other areas. And it seems to me that, you know, it reminds me of when I worked in mental health and I worked with an individual who just um, had a lot of bodily um, stench, just really. And what I had to learn was not to identify with my sense of smell, to just not identify with it, to not have it mean everything that it was telling, wisely telling my body it meant that I didn't actually have to run from it. It wasn't actually dangerous. And, and, to, and so to begin to get the nuances of what parts of the wisdom the ego can give me that I need to use in this moment and discern when to use it, when to not, to become less identified. And that was just really helpful and lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really um, admire your ability to work with, uh, with a person who smells bad. I still remember being um, at the conference with one of my colleagues who was just very nervous over the presentation that he had to make and he was sweating profusely and I remember being so pressed by that that after the day of the, the conference was over I, I went back to my room and I slept for like four hours because I could not emotionally cope with, with bad smell so yeah I could not do what you do <laughs> thank you for doing practice that. practice practice Yes, thank you, Tanya. I appreciate your hypothesis, is it? <laughs> uh, as a fellow biologist. <laughs> um, so you said a couple of things that were interesting to me um, about ethics and how ethics was really important with this sense of self. 
So do you want to say a little bit more about that? Um, so hmm, um, I, I do think that um, sort of the beginning of um, liking oneself for real comes only after we try to like others for real, if you will. So that is how I view the sense of um, the, the, the importance of ethics in this whole ecosystem of, of different senses. Um, you know, I mean, um, you know, Dogen's connection of these concepts too, where he says that uh, taking good care of yourself is spiritual power. That's the last sentence in the paragraph that starts with the family style of all Buddhas and ancestors is to first arouse the vow to save all living beings by removing suffering and providing joy. Uh, in essence, um, you know, once we have this vow um, and aspiration to to help living beings by removing suffering and providing joy, then we can actually um, care to take good care of ourselves too. So um, perhaps there are other modes of behavior, but this, this is, I think, a frequent one because otherwise I don't think it would have been um, sort of nailed down by Dogen, if you will, explicitly. That's so, uh, I really uh, appreciate that about what Dogen says about taking care of yourself. And, um, and then we also talk a lot about this self also getting us in trouble, like you said about the stinging. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and, and Dogen also talks about letting go, right? To forget the self yes. is also when then you can be informed or learned or learn from the 10,000 things, from everything. Yes. Yeah, only when not paying attention to self anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Sunday. <laughs>